from Calvary, and the man in the middle was Jesus, he died for you and me. I wander so aimless, like hell with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Oh, I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more. So happy, no sorrow in sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Just like a blind man, I wandered alone. Worries and fears, I claim for my own. And like a blind man, I gave back his sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I was a fool to wander and strength. Straight is the gate and narrows the way. Now I have traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Oh, I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow. Praise the Lord, I saw the light, Whoa. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more light, now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight, praise the Lord, I saw the light.
There's a path back in the mountain, back to that house where I was born. And even now the memories linger, my mama smiles so soft and warm. Lonesome pine, I can hear you calling, calling me back to my home, where the fox and hound, three hands are calling, lonesome pine. It's been so long since I left that cabin in search of wealth, fortune, and fame. And late at night, when I'm alone and lonely, I still hear my daddy call my name. Lonesome Pine, I can hear you calling, calling me back to my home. And how the males are roaming, lonesome pine calling me home. Someday soon. to the land that I love best in the stillness of the mountains I will find sweet peace and rest lonesome pine I can hear you calling calling me back to my home where the fox and hound through the hills are roaming Lonesome pine calling me home Where the fox and hound through the hills are roaming Lonesome pine calling me I want to stand upon a rock and watch the river flow with the blue sky up above me and the valley down below. I want to hold my head up high and listen to the wind as when it's gone it won't be back again. I want to sing the kind of song that my dad sang to me and try to be he hoped that I would be He said you only get one chance Better do the best you can Cause when it's gone it won't be back again I want to wear my Sunday coat And hold your hand in mine And hear you say you love me Until the end of time I want to find forever Every moment that we spend is when it's gone, it won't be back again.
I want to wear my Sunday coat and hold your hand in mine and hear you say you love me until the end of time. I want to stand upon a rock like I did when I was young and hold you close beside me and watch our children run. But you only get one chance to listen to the wind. Cause when it's gone, it won't be back again. We only get one chance to listen to the wind. Cause when it's gone, it won't be back again. Yeah, when it's gone, it won't be back again. Good morning, church. We're glad to see everybody out there. It's a beautiful day once again in Western Pennsylvania with the clouds and the rain. Um, our announcements this week are, if I can read them, if not, hopefully you can see them. Uh, May 6th meeting uh, at the Supper Club and Grow Kids April 30th. Jesus is there for every day, for me for every day. A youth group is also on uh, April, no youth group on April 30th, okay, because Jeff's gone. Um, May book night, what else do we have? Okay. National Day of Prayer. Okay. Um, anybody have any other announcements? Beverly. Any other announcements? Sure, tell me. Um, about VBS after the slide, but if you can help in any way, shape, or form this year, that would be fantastic because there's a lot of helpers this year that are not going to be available that week. So even if it's um, in the, the month prior prepping and getting things ready, it would be greatly appreciated. So you can just see me afterwards. So thank you. Sure, Beth. Anyone else? So we have a video for VBS. Five, four, three, two, one. Sorting command to internal. Engines off. Opening main door.
So let's start our service in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mike's going to lead us in the uh, call to worship. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, submit to him. We submit ourselves to you as you have gathered us in worship, O God. Please help us to develop our trust in you. Let your will be our will. Amen. And with that, we're going to open with a couple songs. Actually... Tiffany's going to do children's moment. All right. Good morning, everybody. So last week I brought you a treat. This week I brought you a different kind of treat. I brought apples, and we're going to talk about apples today. So do you think apples taste good? Yeah. Well, not only are they good, they're good for you. They're full of vitamins to help you grow. They're fat-free, they're salt-free, they're cholesterol-free. You can sit down, honey. Um, I have this apple this morning. It's called a red delicious apple. Well, did you know, and I did not realize this until I was doing this children's moment, um, studying up on it, there are over 7,500 different types of apples in the world. Did you realize that? That's a lot of different varieties of apples. And they come from the top five countries in the world that produce apples are China, the United States, Turkey, Italy, and France. And there's a lot of different ways that we can enjoy apples, not just to eat them, but how about apple cider or apple juice? How many of you like apple sauce in your lunchbox? Or apple slices with caramel? Or maybe a candy apple if you go to the fair? Or my all-time favorite, how about apple pie? So there's lots of different ways we can eat apples as well. Well, I'm sure you all know where apple trees come from. Or, I mean, apples come from apple trees, right? Yep. So you might, if you, what if you planted an apple tree and you took such good care of it, you watered it, and you just were very careful to make sure that everything was right and it never produced any apples? It wouldn't be very good as an apple tree, would it? Well, do you know that Jesus told a story about a man, and he had a fig tree in his vineyard, but it did not produce any figs. And so for three years, he waited for this tree to produce fruit, but still no figs. So he goes to the man that takes care of the garden, and he says, you know what, I just want you to cut this down. And the caretaker said, well, can you just give me one more year? I will fertilize it, I will take such good care of the tree, and then we'll see if it will produce figs. And you know what? The owner agreed to give the tree another chance. Well, in telling the story about the fig tree, Jesus was actually really trying to talk about us and about God. So do you know that God has planted you on earth and he expects you to produce good fruit? But does he want you to produce apples and oranges? No, he wants you to produce the fruits of the Spirit. And those are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. So if he doesn't see these things in our life, you know what? He's actually willing to give us another chance. So Jesus wants to care for us, and he wants us to be the kind of fruit-bearing children that God wants us to be. So if we trust him, if we read our Bibles, we're coming to church, going to VBS, and praying, guess what's going to happen? It's going to help us to produce fruit. So let us go forth and produce good spiritual fruit in our lives, okay? And let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to have the kind of fruit in our lives that would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I've got apples here, but I also have a lollipop if you'd rather have that, so. We can pick two. Um, just one. So you can pick
All right, we're going to do a couple songs for you. Uh, you can stay seated. We'd love to hear you sing. The words should be up on the screen. Um, I know a lot of the songs you don't know, but they're pretty... Uh, how is that? You're okay? Okay. We're a little confused this morning. So, um, all right, let's uh, see what we can do. Mm -hmm. Blessed Lord, in the light of thy word, let my life be a light on a hill. Leading souls now astray to the straight and narrow way, help me do some good deed while I live. Let my light be a light shining out through the night. May I help struggling ones to the fold. Spreading cheer everywhere to the sad and the long. Let my life be a light to some soul. Give me wisdom and power every day, every hour. Let me drink from the fountain above. Guide my footsteps and ride through the dark and stormy night. Give me peace, give me joy, give me love. Let my light be a light shining out through the night. May I help struggling ones to the fold. Spreading cheer everywhere to the sad and the low. Let my life be a light to some soul. souls for my higher, let my light be on fire, shining out to the world as a guide. Help me rescue someone sinking now with no hope, and in heaven she shall abide. Let my light be a light shining out through the night. May I help the struggling ones to the fold. Spreading cheer everywhere to the sad and the low. Let my life be a light to some soul. Let my life be a light shining out through the night. May I help the struggling ones to the fold. Spreading cheer everywhere to the sad and the low. Let my life be a light to some soul. Sing. 
Thank you very much. Well, as most of you know, I grew up in this church. I was baptized here, confirmed and married. Uh, and if I was a little kid, which of course the church was just over here at that time, uh, if you would have told me your dad's going to be singing in a group while you give the message, let's just say the Lord works in mysterious ways. But I'm happy to be here. Uh, our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verse 1 through 9. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. The word of God for the people of God. Let's bow our heads for a quick word of prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Lead, guide, and direct us. And may your love overflow in all of our hearts here in Segert Town Church this morning. Amen. So we're going to talk about repentance this morning. And uh, if you have your Bibles in front of you, in addition to the scripture reading, we're also going to look at Psalm 51. Uh, but before that, I'm going to take you back to 2006. So in 2006, I was married for one year my lovely bride who's back here. 2006 was a transition period. We had the internet, but we didn't have smartphones. Uh, so for our one year anniversary, I decided to surprise my wife. She had never seen the ocean, 24 years old, and she'd never seen the ocean. So we went to see our friend, Nate, who's in uh, optometry school down in Philadelphia, and I surprised her by going to Cape May, New Jersey the next day. Because we had no smartphones, because we were outside of the state, my PA gazetteer only goes so far, I printed out MapQuest directions. So everybody remembers MapQuest directions. You print it in your destination, put in your destination, print it out, and that was good as gold. It helped you on your way. When we were coming back from Cape May, we took a different way home. I remember reading through the directions, and we were supposed to be in Delaware for about 15 minutes. We start back. We're in Delaware. 15 minutes. 20, 25 minutes. 30, 35 minutes. We're still in Delaware. Delaware. I don't know if you know Delaware. It's a very small state. And we were, if you would have told me today that we were there for six hours, I'd believe you. It seemed like we could not get out of Delaware. Now, the first step to get out of Delaware is we had to recognize that something was wrong. 
we were on the wrong path. We weren't doing something that we were supposed to. Now, we can relate that to our life by saying, well, Ryan, you had map quest directions. They were right. You were wrong. But what do we have in our Christian journey to guide us? How do we recognize when we're on the wrong path in our Christian journey? Oftentimes, we have two competing visions in this world. We have the secular view, what the world thinks, and the Christian worldview of what we should think as Christians. Uh, You can apply this to what love is, what it isn't, uh, what success is, what it isn't, what being a man or woman of God is versus a man or woman of this world. They can be very different views. And here we have to look at what truth is versus what it isn't. There's a big difference in these definitions when we look to recognize we're on the wrong path. Uh, most of you know I went to Allegheny College. I uh, went away from Segertown all the way to Meadville. And Allegheny College is a liberal arts college. So they have three kind of schools of knowledge, the natural sciences, the, sec- or the uh, social sciences, which are not really sciences, and uh, humanities. <laughs> so uh, I took natural science, environmental science was my major. You had to major in one. Then you had to minor in another. So I minored in psychology but they make you take two classes in the third school. So I had to take two humanities. I don't know why. It must have been so I got a day off or I, didn't, or I could sleep in, but I took epistemology. Epistemology is a philosophical class. It's a theory of knowledge, and it's just as exciting as it sounds. Uh, we learned all about the different isms that went through the Western Hemisphere. You know, we learned about rationalism, the thinking man, You know, this puts your mind to Rene Descartes. Uh, I think, therefore I am. Reason and knowledge rules. There's no room for religious belief or emotional response. You are born with innate knowledge. After that, you know, with John Locke, we had another rise in empiricism. You know, we start as a blank slate, and our own understanding builds as we go. It's all through science. We learn it all through science, and everything will be unlocked through that. After that, we get into Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, existentialism experiences everything we don't have an inherent purpose except the purpose to create yourself experiences will help you grow and change and become a better person and then in this country especially in the 50s and 60s we came to postmodernism, which is there is no real reason there is no absolute truth and there is no real purpose we've all become trained relativists this might be true for you but not for them Knowledge, truth, and morality all exist just as a reflection of our culture uh, in a historical con- uh, context. There is no absolutes. Each of these philosophies actually have great things about them. And rationalism, you know, it's, it takes away an emotional response and relies on facts and reason. And that's a good thing. Sometimes we reply or we respond too passionately and we need to stop and think reason and facts. Empiricism, obviously science has unlocked wonderful things to us and has taught us about this world and why it works and how it goes about. Existentialism, that encourages us to step outside of our comfort zone, to experience new things, to mix it up. And even postmodernism, uh, there's a sense of community in postmodernism that we're all in this together. But all of these isms miss the biggest thing when we talk about a Christian lifestyle. They have no absolute truth. There is an answer, and there is a purpose, and there is guiding moral compass, and it's the absolute truth in the Bible that doesn't hold us back. It actually sets us free. Christ said in John 14, 5 through 7, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I am is a much bigger statement than just I am. It means I was, I am, and I will always be. So how do we learn this God's truth? If it was a snake, like I was like telling my son, it would have already bit you. He can't see stuff right in front of him. <laughs> uh, it's the Bible. This is where we get our absolute truth. When we read our Bible, when we study it, uh, when we discuss it with other Christians, when we pray over it, discern, and be a student of the faith, that's how we learn our roadmap and recognize when we're going down wrong paths. You don't have to go to seminary school. You don't have to be a scholar, but you do have to take your faith seriously and learn the truth of God. We're going to go to uh, the Psalm of David real quick in 51, as I mentioned before. This is the story of Bathsheba, uh, Uriah the Hittite, and King David. Uh, The two-minute recap, as you all remember, uh, Uriah was out fighting the Ammonites. Uh, King David should have been out there fighting, but he was on the wrong path. He stayed at home and was hanging out in his roof. 
He saw Bathsheba, invited her into his castle. She became pregnant. Wanting to hide his wrong path, he invited Uriah back and encouraged him to go spend some time with your wife, take a break. And he said, no, I'm going to sleep outside. It's not right that everyone's fighting and I'm home. And when that didn't work, King David sent him back to the, Dave, uh, the battlefield and said, put him up front so he is killed. And he was killed in the fighting. And then Bathsheba, after mourning, came into his house and she, he took her as a wife. And he thought that maybe the sins were hidden. So we'll read through Psalm 51 here real quick. This is David's response after learning that his path was wrong. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire the inner parts you teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will clean, I will clean wash myself and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit away from me. What David was doing in this psalm, it was he was repenting. He recognized the error in his ways, and he ended up turning from it. There's a lot in here. Uh, one is that this is a fallen war, uh, world. We are born into sin. There's a, there's a new kind of understanding that we're born perfect. All we have to do is be the people that we were born. I don't see that in here. You know, we live in a fallen world, and we're taught to repent from a very young age and to turn away from the things of this world and turn to God. It may seem unfair. Uh, I, for example, my mom always says I'm witty. Uh, I have a sharp tongue, and that can cut both ways. Just because I have that doesn't mean it's an excuse for me to use that in a wrong way. God defines the sin. David says that against you and you only, I have sinned. And ultimately, you think, well, what about Uriah? He got killed. When we're made in God's image, anything we do to each other is essentially a sin against God because God defines sin, sin offends God, and he is in charge. So after David recognized he needed some help from the prophet Nathan, but after he recognized that, he repented. So after we recognize that we're on the wrong path, we need to repent. Uh, Repentance is a lot more than saying, I'm sorry. Uh, If anybody has kids, you can understand how maddening it is when you tell your son, stop hitting your brother. Okay, I'm sorry. And he hits him again. Stop hitting your brother. Okay, I'm sorry. Hits him again. That's not repentance. He recognized the wrong, but he's not turning back. My kids don't hit each other. They're perfect. Don't worry about that. Uh, The Hebrew word uh, for repentance, or the closest we can find, is uh, teshuva. And it means more than I'm sorry. It's literally a verb. And for those of you that don't remember English class, a verb is an action. It means to return or to turn. Now, what are we going to turn to? What are we going to turn back to? We're turning back to the righteous path. We have to return from the one that created us, that calls us back, that saves us. We have to return to God. Throughout the whole Bible, we think repentance is mostly just in the New Testament, but it's throughout the whole Bible. The Old Testament, you you could almost sum up the whole thing uh, as the nation of Israel who falls away from God recognizes they're on the wrong path, turns, repents, and comes back. We see that with individuals, we see that with nations, and then, of course, as we get into uh, the New Testament, we start right off with John the Baptist. What's the first thing John the Baptist says? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus calls us to repent numerous times, including in our scripture reading today. Uh, Throughout the rest of the New Testament, the Acts of the Apostle, Paul's letters, all say the same thing, repent, repent repent, repent. Back to then, the sloop in Delaware. Uh, we recognize we were on the wrong path, but you ask me, why aren't you still in Delaware? Because we did something about it. We had to turn around. If we recognized that we were wrong and kept going in that same loop, we would still be there. We had to repent from our bad decisions. Uh, and part of that is taking responsibility that you were on the wrong path. I don't remember very well, because it was 11, 16, 
16 years ago, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I probably blame my wife. I probably blame the directions. I probably blame the state of Delaware for their road signs. But ultimately, I was driving. I went the wrong path. It was my mistake. A lot of times we don't want to turn around in this life, whether it's pride, whether we don't want to be seen as a hypocrite, whether we try to hide our mistakes by continuing going down wrong paths, uh, whether it's temptation. You know, the road of lollipops is a lot more exciting than the road of apples sometimes. Uh, that doesn't mean it's right. And no, kids, eat all the lollipops you want. It's fine. <laughs> uh, so it's a knowledge, a truth that leads to action. Uh, going back to our opening prayer there, uh, I don't know how many people recognize that. That's what Pastor Ken Cooster would say almost before every sermon. Come Holy Spirit, come lead God and direct us. I had a uh, breakfast with Pastor Jeff. It's all a blur. Two or three months ago, maybe. And he asked me, what, what do you love best about Segretary United Methodist Church? And I, I answered off the cuff real quick, the people, which is true. You know, it's, it's a family. I, I love all of you, and it's always been a wonderful time here. But when I got to think about it later that day, you know, what really makes me excited about this church is they've always told the truth. You know, I was baptized by Jack Kemsky. I was too little to remember him, but I remember Dave Davis. I remember Ken Rippin. I remember Ken Cooster. Greenewalt, Little, they've all never feared to say the truth. They've never apologized it. They say it as it is. And we have to have that truth in order to repent. We have so many paths in our lives. We have roads of activities, things we do. We have roads that we buy, our commodities. We have roads in identities, who we are in and outside of the church, how we uh, relate to others. We have roads that are priorities. How often do we stop and think, are these aligned with God's truth? To our scripture reading, at and before the time of Jesus, uh, a lot of people thought the untimely death or disease or disabilities was because someone wasn't living right. You know, uh, it was, well, they kind of deserved what they got. Uh, so Christ is very quick to say, don't compare yourself. Don't be a relativist of, oh, they're, they were worse than me, so I'll be okay. Pilate and the Galileans, uh, there was a Roman fortress next to the temple and they would randomly inflict violence or make up violations and they actually attacked worshipers as they were sacrificing. That's what they meant by mixing the blood. And they thought, boy, they must have been doing something really bad to get that kind of treatment. Or the Tower of Siloam, it was a stone uh, pillar and part of the southern wall of Jerusalem. And it was just a freak accident. We don't know exactly what happened, whether it was an earthquake or not, but it was a tragic accident and someone was killed. And they were trying to rationalize the people with Jesus of, well, why did that happen? Something was wrong. And Christ did two things here. He wanted to point out to us, stop responding to sin based on relative circumstances. It doesn't matter if you sin less or more than others, whether it's minor sins or major sins, which we can argue whether there are minor sins or major sins, but all sin leads to spiritual death. And while we like to focus on the physical death, because that's what we see, that's what we know, Christ was much more worried about spiritual death in us. And the second thing is all, whether untimely or not, we will die. I'm kind of an optimist, but I do recognize that today is the closest I've been to my death. And now. And now. You don't want to focus on that. What you want to focus on is the hope that we have in Christ. Because he is concerned with our spiritual life, not our physical bodies per se. Uh, this parable is short. It's straightforward. You know, it's, there's very little uh, metaphoric uh, leniences here. Basically, God, God plants us. You know, perhaps the man in the vineyard that's taking care and trying to get us to produce is Jesus. And, of course, we're, we're the trees. Um, right when I moved into our house uh, 16, 17 years ago, I planted lots of trees, over 200 trees, um, including six apple trees. I've done a lot more since then, but I started with six apple trees. Every year... I lime them, I fertilize them, I trim them, I wrap uh, chicken wire around them so the deer don't rub them down. And out of those 16 years, I think I've got a return of maybe half bushel apples. <laughs> Doesn't matter how much they're watered, fertilized, you know, I've, I've talked to them, whatever you want to do, they just don't produce a lot of fruit. Um, somebody told me some powerful truth that I should have taken a little more seriously at the time, John Doctor. He said, Ryan, you live a half mile from me, but you're in the valley. You are in one of the best frost pockets in Crawford County. And he is right. 
I was actually at the Bernanke's house the other night. They said, yeah, our pear trees got frosted off already. I said, mine haven't even bloomed. And we live the same distance away, just a half mile around the corner. And the point of that story is it doesn't matter how much you can spend in the word or you can do good deeds and all these things. If you're in the wrong place, if you're in a frost pocket, if you're on the wrong path, you're not going to produce a lot of fruit. The thing I like about uh, this parable, it almost looks like the end of the page is torn off. It's kind of a cliffhanger. Uh, And everybody says, why? What happened? What happened to the trees? Well, we're all here today, and you're the trees. You get to finish your story. You get to say whether you produce fruit or not. The story is still going as long as you're on this earth. Uh, Going back to David in the psalm, the next couple verses of that, after David realized He recognized the sin. He repented. Verses 13 through 15. uh, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me. My tongue will sing your righteousness. After David got to a better spot, he was able to start producing fruit again. He was able to do what God wanted him to. Uh, Repentance can be seen throughout the whole Bible. Uh, You know, think of Saul, who was persecuting Christians, then went to planting churches all over, the apostle of the Gentiles. It's, it's a wonderful story, and it's a dangerous story as well. Um, so we recognize, we repent. There's one more thing, and I like to stop here and always do a disclosure in all of my messages. Uh, when I give a message, I'm usually not talking to anyone in particular except one person. No, it's not you. It's not you. It's me. I usually do messages that help me grow and learn as a Christian. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure some of you are out there saying, Ryan, I've seen you on the wrong path. I'm sure you have. And that's the most important thing of recognizing and repentance. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that might be a one-time thing. But one of the most important things of repentance is that it's repeated. That it's continual. You will continually be tempted. You will find yourself going down paths, but maybe you don't recognize right away that you are. You have to keep turning back to God. Keep turning towards the Son. We so often focus on the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, we forget that we actually have actions to perform. Uh, To do fruits of repentance, it shows our inward change externally. Now, we don't get in through works, but it is a product of our saving grace. God, God and Jesus often said, go and sin no more. This, this parable isn't sugar-coated. Uh, the title of it is repent or perish. It's three words. It's a choice. It's an open-ended story. And we all have to decide what we're going to do. Uh, oftentimes in this world, we'll go down our path and we'll use Jesus as a uh, life insurance. Ah, yeah, this isn't the path I'm really supposed to go down, but it's Okay. I I accepted God, and I'm just going to keep going, keep going. And if something gets real bad, I can use them. Jesus isn't supposed to be our life insurance. He's supposed to be our life. And we do that by turning to him. So recognize your sin by learning the truth, by getting to know God. Repent. Fill your branches with fruit. Actively turn and go towards the things of God. And repeat as necessary. It's not a condonement of that sin, but it does happen, and you are never given up on. You can always turn and go back to God. Amen? Now I have to look at my bulletin because it's different. <laughs> uh, we will have, at this time, a prayer song. We're going to do a prayer song. Uh, the name of our prayer song is Help Me for Holy Arms.
These apartments sure are drafty now, not safe by any means. Especially for a young girl who's barely 17. Bad choices and a bad man confused inside her head. She's about to pull the trigger, but then she prays instead. Help me to hold on, don't let me let go. Lord, it's the only prayer that I know. It surely ain't much, but I'm down so low. Help me to hold on, don't let me let go. It's so easy to judge, but if you look down deep inside, you too might remember a time when you cried. Help me to hold on, don't let me let go. Lord, it's the only prayer that I know. It surely ain't much, but I'm down so low. To hold on, don't let me let go. Help me to hold on, don't let me let go. Thank you. Uh, morning prayer? Sure. Well, I think last time I was here, I don't know if it was the last time or time before, I did a message on hope, uh, on how we should hope in eternal things instead of worldly things, and I compared it to my hope in the Pittsburgh Pirates, which I'll start with that praise right now. I don't know if they've been in first place this late in the ball season <laughs> in April <laughs> in a while, but uh, enjoy the ride while it's here. Uh, do we have any other praises or concerns today we'd like to share with everyone? Yes. Cataract surgery, okay. Double dose of cataract surgeries, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Beth. the move goes smoothly into the benefit, yes. See something back here? Yes, sir. Thank you for that. We'll be praying for it. It's been really quiet for about two and a half minutes, and I haven't heard my boys. That's a prayer. Like, praise there. So. Any others this morning? All right, let's bow our head for a time of silent prayer.
Almighty Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together as one church and to worship here this morning. We thank you for the music and the time to listen to your word. May it help bring people closer to you and to draw them into your presence. Father, we raise a, a number of concerns in front of you today uh, from minor outpatient surgeries to very serious diagnosed illnesses to the undiagnosed. Lord, we ask that you be with each of these individuals as they go through trying physical and emotional times. We ask that you bless and give wisdom to those that are caring for them. And as we go through these different trials in our life and we transition into new areas in and out of hospitals and in uh, other areas, we just pray that uh, you help fill our life with people that will comfort and to give your word to them and will be with them and know that they are loved and cared for, that ultimately we put our hope in you. Lord, we pray for this upcoming week that we have the opportunity to witness, that we have the opportunity to bear fruit, that uh, we take advantage of all the blessings that you give us to advance your kingdom here on earth. We also thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven. We'll have our offertory uh, sung by the seventh day. If you feel compelled to give, uh, collection plates are on either side of the sanctuary. a shining light as you pass through. Remember the promise he gave to you. Hold to his word, trust everything. Live forever in heaven where the angels sing. Where Shall sing above the blue the promise of a world that's new and dear dim nights no more will be when the angels sing for you and me when the angels You'd stand and join us in the doxology. 
And it's going to be different because it's a guitar, not a piano. So we'll do our best. Thank you. You can be seated. So our closing song this morning is uh, going to be moving. Very nice. And actually, that doxology was better than I thought it was going to go. So, uh, For my 18th birthday, my parents got me a wildlife print by Jack Palu, a local uh, wildlife artist. And at the bottom of it is uh, Proverbs 4.18. So receive this benediction. For the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. May you live a life of repentance so that the light of Jesus may shine on you of all your days. Produce fruit and go forward in peace. Amen. All along the weary way And as oft as I desire him He is there to show the way Help me, Lord, me, Lord bear my burdens bear my burdens. Help me, Lord, Help me, Lord I cry, I cry And he answers, he answers I, am I am near thee I will help, I will help but, but you must 
When I'm bored and go without him, I am sure to lose my way. And I fall down in the chasms, and it's there I start to pray. Help me, Lord, help me, Lord, bear my burdens, bear my burdens. Help me, Lord, help me, Lord. Day I cry, day I cry, and he answers. He answers I am You must try. So now I walk with my dear Savior, and the way goes brighter still as I learn to walk beside Him and to do His blessed will. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Bear my burdens. Bear my burdens. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Day I cry. Day I cry. And He answers. Try. And he answers, I am near thee, I will help, but you must try. You are dismissed. Thank you. We're going to sing while you leave, so. I spend my days on that condensed walking horse. I spend my nights with Bible by my side. I spend this life through every trouble riding. I'll spend the next two cross that river wide. Row by row, I'll cross that muddy water. Row by row, I'll reach salvation truck. Row by row, I'll finally meet the Father. Though my tiny they were weary, I won't stop till I reach the other shore. Through the years I've seen his children trouble. Through many tears I've struggled with the flock. And can't tell high but stand and raise our voices. And sing of love that's never gonna stop. Row by row I'll cross that muddy water. Row by row I'll reach salvation truck. Row by row I'll finally meet the Father. Though my body may be weary, I won't stop till I reach the other shore. Row oh, I'll cross that mighty water. Row by row, I'll reach salvation drop. Row by row, I'll finally meet the Father. Though my body may grow weary, I won't stop till I reach the other shore. Till I reach the other shore.